Hello, how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? Great. I want to remind everyone before we kick off that we do have a Q&A portion at the end of this. You can submit questions on the app. So anyway, <laughs> how's it going? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. It's been, it's been a long time. I feel like I can't tell you that I'm tired this week because you just wrapped up a five-week tour and had one day off. How has that been for you? Uh, it's been... It's been everything. I mean, it's been um, a long time coming, and I've, you know, I've, I've been waiting to get back on the road. But uh, then, when you get out there in it, and you know, it can, it can be really grueling for sure. I, um, yeah, it's, it's been ups and downs. I think you hit that like three week stretch. Everybody kind of gets like irritable and misses home, and then by week four. It's like we're laser focused and the band is just dialed in and it's like you never want to come home ever again. <laughs> totally. And about those days off, like how do you unwind? Um, well, you know, if when I was back home, I just immediately was kind of thrust back into mom life. So I go from staying up when I'm on the road, I'm staying up till five or six in the morning. And then um, I go back home and I'm waking up at five or six in the morning with my children um, but yeah, it's just rolling with the punches. I mean, I try to take care of myself. Um, you know, I, I think I'm doing a much better job than I did in my twenties. <laughs> Definitely. And you know, you had an incredible memoir come out last fall. It's called Maybe We'll Make It. Yeah. Thank you. I've read it way more than one time. I won't reveal. Um, before we get into that though, I want to talk about Patty Smith's Just Kids. I know that had a big influence on you. It was. It was. I mean, I'm. I've read a, a lot of uh, memoirs, especially by musicians, but Patty's just hit me in this way that was so visceral. It was. It was the moment that I knew that I was like ready to write one as as a younger artist. Um, I read it in New York for the first time and just went around the city and visited a lot of the places that she talked about uh, with tears rolling down my cheeks. <laughs> and, you know, like her book, you really focus on the early part of your career, which is fascinating. It stops right when everything starts to happen for you. Yeah, I, that's what I loved about her book is it was so much about the struggle and it was what really drew me into her albums was, was her memoir. I mean, I'd, you know, I'd heard her songs before, but it was, it was truly the memoir that was like, okay, she's a brilliant mind, she's a great writer, and, you know, somebody that I aspire to be like. And so paint me a picture of how this came together. I think it was in the pandemic. How did you decide to write this book? So it was even earlier than that, um, you know, I had just finally got my career off the ground and then found myself pregnant with my daughter, Ramona. And um, it was a surprise. And, you know, I was really scared of how it was going to um, kind of further, you know, take things off course. Um, but... I decided during that time and when I came off the road that I needed to do it. I needed to keep my mind busy. I needed to keep myself busy. And so I would just wake up every day and I would take my son Judah to school. And then I would go to this coffee shop and I would write for like six hours and I would eat a lot of food. And, <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, I, I finished that process and immediately um, six weeks postpartum, after having a C-section, I jumped back in the tour bus with both of my children and my band and my crew, and we got out there and, um, you know, just started started touring pretty heavily again. But the memoir sat there collecting dust, and I just couldn't find the time that it needed. Um, so the pandemic, it was actually very useful in, <laughs> in being able to flush that, that manuscript out. And tell me about the difference in creative energy from like, you know, this is your fourth album that just came out, we'll get to that, and the book, like how does that differ for you? Oh, they are very different processes. Um, I felt like when I was in book writing mode that my songwriting was, was suffering a little bit, and um, 
my husband was like, oh, yeah, I haven't written a song in like a month. And and uh, I was like, but you don't understand. It was just all consuming. And it was like, I was also reading a lot of memoirs and, you know, trying to um, keep my mind fresh with just other novels and, and things. And so finally being able to uh, get that done a little bit, then I started working on Strays again. And it, it, for a while I was working in tandem with both of them. And you know, the obvious difference to me is that you can mask vulnerability or stories in your songs, which you do so expertly. But in this book, you're completely vulnerable. You know, you tackle trauma, substance abuse, family struggle, the struggle of being a musician and working constantly and being homeless at one point. Um, what was that like for you to be so stripped back? It was terrifying. <laughs> it was, um, it was like I was standing naked, you know, for all the world to see. And I, I did really struggle with it. After I turned in the final draft, I thought, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to put this out there. And it was, I was worried that my family was going to be ashamed of me. I was worried that, you know, friends were going to be upset at me. And, and you know, not all of that happened. It had a much different outcome than than I thought it was going to. And it, it kind of reminded me of putting out Midwest Farmer's Daughter, my first album that finally took off. And the same kind of feelings that I had at that point. Um, because, you know, my, my family didn't know that I had been arrested and had a misdemeanor and lost my license. I mean, my sister didn't even know that. And so when that album was getting ready to come out, I thought, how on earth am I going to explain this to my grandma? <laughs> um, but with the process of the book, I also really did try to tell my story without airing out anybody else's dirty laundry. And, you know, at times I felt like, you know, I, I skimmed over some things in my childhood. I did, in fact, hold a lot back. I know a lot of people would be surprised because it seems like I just wrote a tell-all. Uh, but um, I did hold a lot back. And it was... Um, but it was ultimately, in the end, it was very freeing. It was freeing to own my truth. And, you know, I have people that write stories and stuff about me all the time. So it was nice to be able to frame it in the way that I wanted and we've spoken about memory and how you really wanted to get all of this down now before the years go by. What was it like to revisit your past, even your childhood? Was it like investigated for you? Did you discover things? I, d I did do a lot of research um, with, you know, even questioning my band because sometimes it's like piecing together a crime scene. You're like, I remember that show. I think we got two bottles of bourbon and you know and then the, the memories start to blur so we all kind of went back together and and did get to talk about some of those tours some of those moments um the you know investigating about the family farm was i think traumatic for my family to go into and it's been a mystery that i've been trying to solve for a, my entire life and nobody really wants to talk about it because it's like a you know kind of a shameful thing to them. I don't see why it would be, but, you know, just the failure of it and being reminded of it. So I asked multiple family members, aunts, uncles, my father, kind of what do you think happened? Where did it all go wrong? And, um, and so that was nice. I, I feel like I finally got to the bottom of, of all of that. And what about your husband, Jeremy? Because he's been through so much of this with you. Was he okay with this all being out there? He was, surprisingly enough. I think, um, you know, he kind of pushed me to even go in further with our relationship and everything that happened after we lost a child. And, you know, the first draft of this of this memoir looked much different with, than the final one. And, you know, he just was like, you should be transparent about what we went through because it's not that simple to just lose a baby and then you don't just you know, shake it off and move on. It was years and years of us trying to hold our marriage together. The career was failing and, you know, everything just seemed like it was in a downward spiral. And so the fact that we did make it out um, with our marriage intact is 
very meaningful. And I think if we weren't in such a good place that there would have been no way that I could have shared the things that we went through. Oh, of course. Do you think that later on you'll do a second book? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm what, sadistic like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love the question of this because I have to ask, if, you, if this book was turned into a movie, who would you want to play you? Oh, I, well, you know, I feel like Barbara Streisand was... Um, but I don't know, maybe Alana Heim. I think she would be, she was incredible in Licorice Pizza, and I, I really love her. She could kill it. <laughs> and let's get to this album, because at the same time, you have, you're working on this record. It's incredible. Um, is there a theme to it or anything you want to like start talking about? Uh, the album, this is the longest that I've ever worked on an album, and, you know, I think going from Midwest Farmer's Daughter, which was three days in the studio, and this was like three years. Um, I mean, the bulk of it was like more like three weeks or something, but um, I was, you know, I at the same time I was putting out this memoir and I was really worried with how it was going to be received. I was worried about judgment, about, you know, people thinking I was a bad mother or a bad person. Um, and in the same vein, I knew that I was going out on a limb with making an album that was very psychedelic and had a lot of newer sounds when I have typically just been mm -hmm. this traditionalist and, you know, the, I, a big piece of me always will be that way. But um, both of them were leaps into the unknown. And I think that fear, like, leading up to it was... Oh, it was a roller coaster ride, and it was it was very freeing to just get them both out and and say no. I I stand by this. This is my muse. This is where it, I wanted to go, and and being able to play live again and and get back to playing these songs live, being out on the road. I think that that's where me and my band really thrive as as a live band. So it's been nice to help them come to life because I think you know my third album I released it during the pandemic. And which was, of course, produced by Sturgill Simpson. And, um, you know, we didn't get to play those songs live. And I think that it would have, I don't know, it just would have allowed us to uh, to kind of keep going on this trajectory. But if, you know, if everything was easy for me, then I wouldn't be Margot Price. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Um, I can think of so many great albums that I love because of the opening track. And I feel like yours kicks off with a lot of fury. It's been to the mountain. And, you know, it's very declarative. You sing, like, I have nothing to prove. I've got nothing to sell. Which I think is, like, a great summary of, like, your career. Like, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I, I love an album that you can put on. And it's, like, especially the whole front half is just, like, all killer, no filler. That's where we were definitely trying to go. Um, but I did kind of want to make this mission statement that I don't know there's just separated me from the herd of blonde country singers or something because I <laughs> I mean I've tried to dye my hair I've tried to be many different people and um and I think as I'm coming into my fourth decade of my life I'm just I'm realizing that it's fine to just be yourself and you mentioned the psychedelic part of this, which is wild to me because it's it fits so well. It's like you naturally stepped into this different sound. You have always said that you were considered too rock for country and too country for rock. Do you feel like now you're in a good place where you feel confident in your sound? I do, but I feel like um, it maybe alienates me from, I don't know, everybody. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people that like, rock and roll and they like country and it's it makes perfect sense to me I mean you look at somebody like even Johnny Cash and to me he was like the epitome of rock and roll um or somebody like Lucinda Williams who I know she has felt that way her whole life yes give it up for Lucinda and shout out because her book don't tell anybody the secrets I told you is going to be out soon um but it's you know really being able to have mentors like her and just people that I look up to and admire in my life um, in, in the music world that it's kind of made me feel okay because I think, you know, everybody's always worried, am I growing fast enough? And, you know, am I still on the upward trajectory or have I flatlined, you know? And 
And that is something that, um, that I really wanted to do. I wanted to push the boundaries. I wanted to go out in the water where, you know, like David Bowie says, where you just where your feet can't touch. And like, that's right where it gets good. Um, Jonathan Wilson was absolutely incredible to work with. And we had so much fun making that record. It's going to be really hard to top that experience and, and just that time. But that's always what you hope for. You have always said you felt alone in the music scene. Do you still feel that way? I think um, at times, yes. But I know that there is an incredible scene. There's a, a wonderful sea change happening in Nashville, even though uh, it feels like there's a lot of pushback at times. The Americana Music Association, um, you know, folks like Allison Russell, Idea Victoria, um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, fresh new energy coming into music, and I do feel very hopeful. And I think that you know, at times I have said that I feel alone because I pushed myself out in that place. But um, I, you know, I, I I'm not gonna lie. It, goes through my mind maybe sometimes that I should move west and maybe I should get out of the south but I do have such a great community of friends there I mean Brittany Howard and I get to go fishing uh you know Sturgill Simpson he doesn't live in Nashville but he's he's out there and and Tyler Childers and um there is really a great community of of artists that right now currently that are that are um pushing the boundaries and, and, and changing the mold of, of what we think country music is supposed to look like. And one more thing about the album is that you have incredible um, contributors on there. You have a Sharon Bennett and duet um, and Mike Campbell from the Heartbreakers. He doesn't do a lot of stuff like that. Um, what was it like to collaborate with him and why do you love that band? I mean, I just grew up listening to Tom Petty and I feel so lucky that Mike Campbell has kind of become like this songwriting mentor to Jeremy and I. Um, I was just texting with him this morning about writing a song together. Um, having his support behind me and uh, even, you know, we had some, made some early demos of Strays and we went to his house to, to write and to hang out and I played him Been to the Mountain and he was like, that's the recording right there. He's like, you don't even need to re-record that. It sounds great and it's killer. And so kind of having him in my corner has given me a lot of newfound confidence for sure. You said he did that solo on the record one time. Is that true? Yeah. That's, that's insane. Call it bow ditties. He's like, oh, you want bow ditty, bow ditty, bow ditty. I can do that. <laughs> and, you know, we, we nerded out about this earlier as uh, f crazy female Bob Dylan fans. Um, you had your book come out in the fall, the same time that he had one come out. What was that like for you as like a true hardcore Dylan fan? Oh my gosh, I seeing my memoir like next to his book was so surreal. Um, and then the really funny thing is too, is we had just um, cut that Elvis Costello song, Pump It Up, like three weeks before Bob's book came out, and then turning to page two and seeing Elvis Costello pump it up, I was like, we're on the right trail. Something, something cosmic is happening for sure. You said that while you were writing the book, you didn't write a song for like a month. Um, how is it different for you now? Like, are, when you're on the road, are you able to write normally? I'm writing a bit. Um, like I was telling you backstage, I've been getting a, a, a good amount of people hitting me up. Um, to you know, write like essays and stuff. I just wrote something for um, uh, Loretta Lynn. I wrote something for Patsy Cline. I'm working on a piece about Janis Joplin. So that's been a lot of fun. But um, I have been writing songs for this film that someone approached me about. So songs have still been happening, um, and I think I'm you know I'm always listening in my day-to-day -day conversation for anything brilliant that somebody might say. I've always got notes in my phone for song titles and I'm already thinking about my next move and really realizing that I need to get back in the studio because I know 
how long it takes to get the whole process done. Um, so yeah, I think as soon as I can peel myself away from the road, I'm going to do a little writing retreat again. Yeah. I can't wait for that. And you have apparently, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but you've said that at this point in your life, you're not so focused on accolades and like crazy opportunities that you would get because you're very selective. Do you feel like that still? Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, everybody wants to be like recognized for their work. And um, and I, I do very much feel like I have that. I have, you know, putting this this album out and putting this book out and just having good reviews, even having bad reviews. Somebody gave me a bad review in Nashville the other day in the Nashville scene. And this guy was like writing up my show. Sorry, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but he was, <laughs> I got to tell the story. He was writing up my show for the Ryman, but he like kind of reviewed all four of my albums very scathingly. And again, I was like, man, I got to get out of Nashville. Like, what am I doing here? But it was like, no, I know that I'm on the right path if I have haters and if I have people that I don't want everybody to get it. I'm not for everybody. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not making music for every single person. And and the accolades and, and all that stuff, it's, it's so much pageantry, you know? I think it's distracting and I've seen Jimi Hendrix talk about this. He doesn't want people to call him a genius because it's just going to get him lost. I think it's, um, I try to keep my feet close, close to the ground. You know, I've always looked up to you and you're so inspiring for so many reasons, but I really think you're so comfortable in your own skin, especially now. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you recently quit drinking three years ago. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it relates to your art? Yeah, I, you know, I think I give off this very, like, confident, um, very comfortable in my own skin, but I am still very much struggling. I think just being a woman in this industry is, there's just impossible double standards. There's, you know, we live in a day and age where, um, even just aging is like a crime. And, you know, men just get to like grow into these like beautiful, distinguished, uh, wise, you know, like versions of themselves. And as women, we're just not allowed that. But I do feel like quitting drinking has been the start of me like healing things that I have just been pushing down and numbing out. And, and um, it was very problematic. It was, you know, at times it was really fun. And there's a lot of good times out there that I like to recall and, and laugh about. But um, where I'm at right now, it feels very good. It feels good to wake up in the morning and not have to uh, wrestle with the decisions of the night before. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sober. I always like to um, clarify that. I've been working on a country song that's called uh, Not Drunk, but I'm not sober. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it is it's something that I never, ever thought that I would be, would be a non-drinker. And I absolutely have psychedelics and psilocybin to thank kind of as that catalyst. I know it sounds really ridiculous. Like I took this one drug and it stopped me from taking this other drug, but I saw things very clearly um, during the psychedelic experience that I had. And, and I woke up the next day and it didn't stop there. It was, I went out, I got a lot of books on the subject and I got a lot of information and it, it was really just going to be a break really at first. I was like, I'll just take a little break. But once I figured out the science kind of behind what it was doing to my brain, um, I thought, okay, well I've done this enough and it was fun until it wasn't fun. And I still love to go out to bars. I still, I really do. I think, you know, the, the I love to socialize and I think that that's like one thing that a lot of people when they when they you know quit drinking or something they feel like they have to uh, just I don't know not be around it and it's like I will still pour people shots of tequila I will pour a 
you know, queer bow down your throat if we're partying. I don't, I don't care. But, uh, but I just, I feel better removing it from my life. And a lot of that too is my early family trauma and a lot of the stuff that I really didn't even go into in the book. But it's been a, a great healing process. You know, you're, even though you're comfortable in bars, like on the road, it must be, you're surrounded by that all the time. Like, do you ever miss it? Are there any cravings at all? Actually, so yeah, this five week tour that I took, um, you know, started out really, really strong. It was like, and I think one night I did kind of get the itch and I felt like, I just felt very restless and I felt like, you know, why do I have to tell everybody that I quit drinking? Because it is, it's like accountability, you know? It's like, man, I said it out loud, I did it, and like, there's no going back right now, but, you know, to quote one of my favorite songs, storms never last, do they, baby? And um, just kind of like got, got through that moment. Um, I do like to drink kava tea in the evenings, which I only have one glass because I think it can be damaging to your liver, but... Just poured myself a cup of tea and um, and lit up a joint and thought about Willie Nelson being out there all those years and how he kind of did the same thing. He was able to quit drinking and 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 he's been such a huge um, inspiration for me in in that as well because he you know he made it look cool. He definitely did make it look cool. Um, and you know we mentioned this before, but I also want to like emphasize the book was very different before you quit drinking. Can you talk about that decision and how it changed the shape of it? Yes, my editor, Naomi Huffman, who's just a brilliant writer in, in her own right, um, you know, I would like call her, this was d deep COVID, and I would call her with questions about how to use Microsoft Word and stuff like that. <laughs> like, I don't understand where your notes and where you're, you're writing in to all these changes that you want, but I also called her a couple of times because she had uh, sent me a note that said, you know, whiskey is like another character in your book. And I think, you know, a lot of my drinking and the way that I was framing it, I mean, it was very destructive. I mean, even from my early days of like, you know, just back roading and drinking and driving, it was so incredibly dangerous and somebody could have been hurt much worse than they were. Um, but having her say that to me was like a shock to the system. And um, I was, I knew that something big was approaching and I knew that something had to give because I just felt so purposeless during the pandemic. I thought, you know, when I was on the road and I was touring, um, kind of after things took off, you know, after Third Man signed me, I'd... I could keep it under control a lot because I had something to live for. I had these like shows and I had fans and I had things and I thought, I'm gonna get drunk at the end of the tour. Like, that's, that'll happen. But um, when I was home during the pandemic, it just was, I was tail spinning. And um, so I was kind of almost like ramping up my drinking because I knew that I wanted to quit. Uh, Sounds like very destructive, but it was because I thought I want to do it so much that I'm just sick of it. It's like when your parents catch you smoking and they're like, you're going to smoke a whole carton of cigarettes. It was like uh, one of our sponsors, White Claw. Thanks. But it, yeah, it was, uh, it was really, um, it was through the process of writing the book that also helped me. And speaking of White Claw... Um... <laughs> You you did mention earlier, like, something that I love is that you have said all the benefits you've experienced without drinking. You're like, I look amazing. Can you can you talk about, like, you I mean, you mentioned that you used to, like, um, you're like, I don't even have to go on the treble anymore because I'm not drinking, like, seven White Claws a night. Um, how else have you felt internally, like, health-wise? Oh, well, I think, you know, I have really struggled with depression my whole entire life. I have... Uh, you know, almost self-diagnosed myself as, oh, I must be bipolar, I must be manic depressive, I must be, and you know, I, I have a lot of family members that have struggled with that as well, and being able to remove that, I mean, I was this close to just getting on antidepressants and thinking like, okay, well, if, if I don't change something, you know, I, I might not be safe with myself, and um, yeah, just 
being able to, to get up and feel good in the morning is just such a gift. And it's like, I see a lot of my friends still struggling with it. And I'm like, it really doesn't have to be as hard as you think, because I, I think that when you, you know, potentially do have, um, some kind of, you know, like a touch of a, a mental disorder or whatever you want to say that it can fuel that. And I, I was feeling so bad at, right before I quit. Um, that, you know, and it took a while. It wasn't like, oh, a month later and I just feel great. It was, it was months of, of kind of coming out of that fog and also just being comfortable in my own skin. I didn't want to tell a lot of my friends. I didn't want to tell my fans even. I thought um, people might not want to come to my shows if I'm not the fun party girl. It was also wrapped up in my identity of who I was. And I realized that, you know, that a substance wasn't making me who I was. I was just like that anyway. Um, when we were in New York, the band and I played this amazing show at Webster Hall, and we got kicked out of our green room immediately, like, after the set. Was, New York will keep you humble like that. Um, but we, you know, the boys all wanted to go to a bar, and I put my credit card down, and I bought them all drinks, and I, like, danced my ass off all night. My tour manager was laughing. He's like, you look like the life of the party here. And I'm like, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I was, yeah, and I wasn't drunk. And, you know, you're still the party girl, as you just said, but, like, a song like Hurtin' on the Bottle, which, if any of you have seen a Margot Price set, it's one of the best moments. It's, like, a crazy closer, usually. Has that changed for you to sing that song? Like, do you feel weird about it? Do you love it even more? What is that like? Well, for a moment, we put it down, and it wasn't even... I think it was when I was still drinking. I was like, oh, I don't want to sing that song anymore. You know, you just kind of get burned out on things, mm -hmm. but... And after I quit drinking, I was like, I am more qualified to sing drinking songs than anyone. And um, yeah, so we we brought it back, and you know, we usually do a medley uh, with it, kind of a nod to who we ripped it off from, which is you know, like Whiskey River, and I uh, think I'll just stay here and drink. So. Yeah, even I've realized in a lot of my songs, like Hands of Time and uh, my song Don't Say It, you know, there's lines like, um, uh, if you drink all night, you'll be thirsty all day. And, you know, there's always, there was always like hints of, uh, of it even being problematic. And Hands of Time, I say, um, I was running, let's see, out in the bars and running with the men, but the, the men brought me problems and the drinking brought me grief. And I wrote that back in 2015. So it's something that was a really long time coming and it's not like I just quit and it was overnight. I mean, this was a decade of cognitive dissonance. Yeah, and you're still working at it. I feel like it never stops. Absolutely. Um, something that I really love about the book is that you talk about music so well, which it's a lot easier than it sounds to write about music especially when you want to convey how much you love it, and you do such a good job of that. Um, growing up, what were your influences? It was such a wide range of things that I was kind of brought up on because um, you know, my grandmothers, they both loved country music, and they always you know, were playing things like Patsy Cline and, and Loretta Lynn for me. Um, but when I was sitting in the back of my dad's truck, he always had on classic rock and he would do that thing where he would quiz me. He'd be like, who's this? You know, like two lines in. And I'd be like, Led Zeppelin? <laughs> I don't know. And it, you know, it used to really bother me, but I mean, that is where I got a, a, a lot of my musical education was, you know, cause I was like, I don't want to listen to the oldies station dad. Like I wanted to listen to like top 40 BS. Um, but also, you know, I, I go back to albums like uh, Fiona Apple's like first album and Jewel's first album and and Car Wheels on a Gravel Road and like those albums had a profound effect on me. What about concerts? Did you see any that left a huge mark on you about like how you wanted to be a performer? Well, living out in the middle of nowhere was not very good for concerts, but um, you know, occasionally we would drive somewhere we saw my my dad loved Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers so we did get to go drive and see them when I was very young and I remember being up on his shoulders and and thinking like this is really cool um I think you know seeing Stevie Nicks when I was young had a huge 
effect on me. And, um, and then, you know, we would also like go to the county fair and I would see, uh, a lot of, a lot of country bands at the time. Like I remember waiting outside of, uh, Trisha Yearwood's trailer for an autograph, I think, when I was 15. But, you know, that that was kind of more the, the vibe. And Susie Boggess, who's from my hometown, she was a, a 90s country star. And knowing that, like, she could make it out of this town that was, like, population 3,000 was huge for me to see that. Yeah, absolutely. And was there a specific moment for you where you knew you wanted to be an artist or was it just you kind of always inherently knew that? I think, you know, I'm a, my mom had me in dance lessons very young and I was always, she was always like teaching me like songs and dances and I was putting on performances for my parents. We would like make tickets and it was always something that was kind of there. But I do remember career day rolling around and everybody getting the piece of paper and you had to write down what you wanted to be. And I think I wrote down like Broadway performer and... And then my teacher came and like squashed my dreams and told me that wasn't really a job that I could have. <laughs> but um, they did let me go to a theater um, that was about an hour away in the Quad Cities. And I, I did do like a little, just a day in the life of like someone working in the theater. But um, yeah, it's kind of, I knew that, that it was something that I, that I always wanted to do. You've met so many of your idols along the way and you've had crazy, wild interactions. Can you tell me one that really um, meant a lot to you and what they told you or what you talked about? Oh my gosh, it's gonna be hard to pick. Um, well, I remember sitting down for a conversation just like this at Third Man Records during Americana Week with Emmylou Harris. And like I had to interview her and she was just, terrifying experience terrifying. <laughs> but, but she was so nice and so wonderful um but I didn't know it at the time I was actually pregnant with Ramona and we were talking about having children and I remember her saying that for a long time people didn't want to sign a girl singer to the big labels because they thought oh you're you're just going to get pregnant and you're going to have to come off the road and she was like and you know what I did get pregnant and everything was fine <laughs> right and then a couple of weeks later when I took that pregnancy test like her words were just ringing through my ears like okay she said it's gonna be fine <laughs> I mean also I think Loretta um, has given me similar advice and and she called me on the phone and asked me if I would perform at her birthday party at um, at uh, Bridgestone Arena and she said uh, my daughter Patsy said that you're thinking about having another baby. Well, I was pregnant and just not telling anybody because it hadn't been three months yet. And she goes, I just wanted to tell you that I think that, you know, you should have four more babies if you want and you'll be fine. Your fans will love you anyway. And those two moments were, um, were wonderful. You know, you were recently added to the Farm Aid Board of Directors, which is so cool. I think it's you and Annie who are the two female board of directors. Um, you grew up in a family with a struggling farm, as you've mentioned. What does that mean to you? It was a very full circle moment. And, you know, just being able to get the call from uh, Farm Aid to even play the first one. And that was, that was huge. And I, you know, I did call my grandma and call my folks and, and tell them. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it makes the loss, I don't know, it feel, um, it was, it was something that was always there, like haunting me my whole life. And it just feels like it's, it's a way that I can give back a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to get too dark here before the Q and A, but there's going to be a time where Go for it. a lot of, a lot of those board members won't be here anymore. Um, do you see yourself carrying the torch and bringing that on? I think that Farm Aid and, and Willie and Neil and, you know, of course it was kind of Bob Dylan's like idea, I think, in the first place, but um, they have been ahead of their time and everybody at Farm Aid, the way that they have been kind of working to combat climate change and, um, you know, create 
equality for for everyone and food justice is is human rights justice it's all wrapped in there together and i think that now more than ever we need farm aid and i know that there's a lot of incredible artists that also deserve to to be on the board and and i know that it will live on it's going to be amazing this year um thank you so much i want to read some q a questions out loud thank you this is actually a really good one um You've talked about this before, but I think it's still, I could hear you talk about it forever. What was it like to meet Anthony Bourdain? <sighs> I, I really keep that, that memory and, and a lot of the advice that he gave to me so close to my heart. Um, I mean, he was incredibly influential on me as a writer, um, just as a great mind, a thinker, a traveler. And he definitely wanted to be a musician. You know, I think he was like, man, if I could sing, I'd be doing the same thing. Um, he sent me a message shortly after I was on his show and it just said, you deserve all good things coming your way. And sometimes when I'm feeling sad, I just kind of go back to that. And, um, just wish he, wish he was here because I know that he had more brilliant work to do. Totally. Um, this one says, Lindsay wants to know, I loved your audio book. How is your experience recording it different from recording an album? Oh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I spent three days in the studio in Nashville and um, I had never met the engineer. I had never met the producer and I was in there, you know, reading some of the most vulnerable moments of my life for these, just these two full grown men that I'd never met. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly what chapter it was, but um, it was one of the later ones. And I was just bawling in the control room and I was bawling in the isolation booth. And I looked out into the control room and they were both crying with me. <laughs> That's it so was, sweet. It was really special. Um, yeah, it, I had a lot of fun, and it was great to like unearth all these old demos and like some of my early recordings of of my voice because I like hadn't found my voice yet, and it was really special to be able to include all of those early songs and just early attempts at um, at making music. Yeah, totally. Andrew wants to know who are a few up and coming acts you have your eye on. Is there anyone you would want to work with? Well, I just uh, released a single with Sierra Farrell. Um, I I love her so much. She is um, she is one of the best new voices in in that kind of world. But um, oh my goodness, there's so many incredible bands out there that just deserve more um, attention than they have. I think. Uh, the Deslons, who are here performing this this week, um, they're one of my one of my favorite voices, and they've been around for a while. But I just I think they deserve to be massive. Um, I also on my headlining tour, I just took out um, Trey Burt, who is signed to John Prine's Oh Boy Records. Incredible writer, um, Cam Franklin. I'm about to be working on an album with her. Um, she's from Houston and I just, I love her so much. Um, uh, let's see, Lola Kirk, I brought her out and she was really a joy to have out on the road. I love her music and I love her energy. Um, yeah, let's see, I already talked about Adia and everybody knows Allison Russell now, which is great. But yeah, there's, I'll, I'll keep thinking on that too. I get very defensive sometimes as a Margot Price fan because it's not, you know, you were a working musician for so long and the success you're having now, I have to constantly tell people, like, she's not new. You know, like, she's, she's incredible. Um, you're so good at highlighting other people's voices like that too who are working musicians who are just finally getting their due. I mean, I just know how long I wanted somebody to, like, reach down and just say, like, here, come open a show for me or, you know... Um, that goes a long way. And I, I, I think that even, you know, this week during South by Southwest, there's so many incredible artists that you could go see. I have a friend who's an Austin musician, great writer, 
comedian. Uh, his name is Willie McGee, and he's playing around town. And if you can go see one of his shows, you will never forget it. Wesley's bringing uh, the fire question here. Can you remember a fan interaction that sticks with you to this day? Oh my goodness. Um, oh, I've had I've had so many moments with fans that really kind of pull me out of, you know, sometimes I think like, is this the right job for me? Do I need to just like be home with my children more? And um, there was a, a, a woman who came to a couple of my shows on this headlining tour and she said that her husband introduced me to her music, but he just passed away like a year ago and she's very young. Um, and she, she brought his ashes to, um, to the show and we just, we just kind of shared a moment, shared a moment for, um, how brief life is, how quickly this, this all can be gone in a flash and, and yeah, moments like that. Um, there's also been a couple people that I've signed my autograph on them and then they get it tattooed it wild or like a, a couple that I met that um, named their daughter after me. There's, you know, at the end of my show, I've like thrown out roses and it's something that I stole from Charles Bradley after seeing Charles Bradley perform and he would go walk down into the crowd and he would give everybody roses and I thought it was so wonderful but started doing that at the end of my show and I just found out that uh, a couple f of these fans had ended up at a bar after the show very far away about an hour from where the concert was and they were sitting at opposite ends of the bar and both of them had a rose and they said where'd you get that rose from? And they were like, Margo Price. Like, where'd you get that rose from? Margo Price. They're getting married now. <laughs> That's unreal. That's amazing. I love that so much. And a couple other people met in line at my book signing in San Francisco, and they're getting married as well. Wow, you're really making this all happen for everyone. <laughs> Love connections. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Sophie wants to know, you mentioned that Strays took longer than any other album you've made. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I think in the past I had really, I had rushed things. I just felt like I was so tired of just like waiting for things to happen. And so, you know, Midwest Farmer's Daughter, it was like a fight against the clock. Like, I have to get this out. And All American Made as well. I thought like, I've got to follow this up. I've got to get it out immediately. And actually during the recording of All American Made, um, it was in the winter and we'd had the studio booked forever. I had a sinus infection and I just powered through and, you know, did everything I could. But in hindsight, I'm like, man, I wish I would have spent more time on that. It's there forever. So this time it was really just about wanting it to be as as uh, as much of my vision as I could and so it um and then there was also just like a lot of planning post pandemic of like when is a good time for me to put this out when can I get vinyl the vinyl pressing has absolutely been a nightmare for indie artists and that's you know that's the only thing that gets me on the charts um but when you've got you know Adele fans and Olivia Rodrigo fans that you know, God bless them. They, they want it to hang on their wall. It's, it's like, oh, we got to get more pressing plants out there. So thanks Metallica for just starting one. Seriously, I can't believe it over the past few years, just how long it takes indie artists to get their albums out. It's unreal. It's wild. And it's actually, it's, it is really harmful to indie artists. And I, I just wrote a article a few months ago for No Depression that was kind of about the death of indie artists and how we could be seeing that over, you know, the next, I don't know how many decades, but I just think that we really have to start investing in, in the arts, in music and, and painters. And that's not something that the United States does, unfortunately. Definitely not. Um, Trace wants to know what was the most challenging part of the writing process in the book? Ooh, um, it was, I think it was deciding what to put in and what to leave out. And, you know, I, my old band Buffalo Clover, um, it's a, that was all very, um, sensitive. Uh, and as I skim over it, I will just say Fleetwood Mac drama, but, um, that was definitely the like kind of the the thing that was weighing most on me was do I include the troubles that Jeremy and I had and do I include how that band really fell apart and um it's been tough I don't know if there'll be a reunion 
but I don't know if anybody cares because we didn't ever have any fans. <laughs> I love this next question. Um, Jonathan Wilson is an amazing producer who worked on the album with you. You guys did this in Topanga Canyon. Um, Jonah wants to know how that impacted the sound and feel of the album. Oh, um, I think from, you know, I've been in a lot of studios in Nashville, and it's like you go in at 10 a.m., you get done at 6, you're in a windowless room for X amount of hours. And at Jonathan's, um, we would go in at like, maybe noon or 2 p.m. We would saunter in and his place was just like nestled in the canyon and there was red tail hawks flying overhead and, uh, you know, rattlesnakes and stuff out there. I would go hike and um, spend time in, in nature during the day. It was like any time we had a break, and step outside, get a breath of fresh air. Um, and also uh, David Briggs' house was old house was just right across the street Crazy. so we knew that there was like neil young vibes mm -hmm. just all around i love that for the hardcore neil young fans out there that's a big deal <laughs> it is it is yeah um i love this question this question from Kristen. uh your album had wildflower seeds i planted them so thank you lady bird johnson was a huge advocate for wildflowers in texas what is your favorite flower oh it's beautiful um I love Indian paintbrushes. I um, I grew up, you know, in in the country, and while my folks didn't have the farm when I was young, um, every summer we would go out. We had some old railroad ties that were running through the back of our yard, and my mom doesn't have much of a green thumb, but uh, we would sow wildflowers into it, and they would come up every year. And um, my dad came to my house and. Of course, we'd been gone on tour, and so my landscaping looked a fright. And uh, he's like, you just got a bunch of weeds here, but I went ahead and threw some wildflower seeds in there so they'd pop up for you. It's, yeah, definitely go for the more uh, rugged, rustic, and uh, especially, like, it's important to me what is, like, native to the area. Definitely your entire vibe. <laughs> this is a good place to end for Tim's question, um, who's going to make me read some math out loud. Let's see if I can do it. With there just being a fraction of small farmers left, for example, 33,000 dairy farmers versus 150,000 in the 80s, how can farm aid save the American farmer? Well, uh, I don't think farm aid can do it alone. I know that. And, you know, they have just got a... a couple huge grants and it's incredible to see where they put the money because um, you know in the past a lot of these like bailouts and government loans have went to to white farmers and so it's really incredible work to see where farm aid is putting that money but um, they absolutely can't do it alone and we're just going to need a huge movement of people that um, care about climate justice, food justice, and, um, and the American farmer. I could literally talk to you for like five more hours, but I'm sure everyone wants to eat some barbecue. Um, thank you so much. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for being here.